Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for IFAS AI and Data Science Seminar Series. Today, we have a very exciting speaker and presentation. Uh, Dr. Raquel Diaz is an assistant professor at microbiology and cell science department. And Dr. Diaz completed her PhD at University of Florida under an NSF fellowship focused on structural biology, evolution, and machine learning. Uh, she completed postdoc research at Northern Arizona University and worked as a senior staff scientist at Scrit Research Institute. Uh, her postdoctoral work focused on artificial intelligence applied to human genomics and translational sciences. Dr. Diaz and her lab uh, currently develops and applies AI technique to examine important research question across multiple fields of biological sciences and biomedical research. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Diaz, floor is yours. All right, thank you so much for the nice introduction and for this opportunity to share uh, my projects and results here. Um, let me share this screen first. All right, hopefully you can see the full screen. And okay, and, and thanks for everybody uh, joining this session. So today I would like to talk about, uh, I picked two major uh, projects in my lab. Uh, that may be uh, useful for many uh, members of IFAS and may be an opportunity for collaborations. So initially, some of these projects focus more in human genomics, but later I'm starting to adapt these uh, AI models to other species, including species of agricultural uh, interests. So hopefully you find some uh, interesting things here, maybe some interesting tool to use in your project. Uh, after uh, this presentation. All right, so the two projects that I uh, selected to talk about today, uh, one of them, the first one, is more focused on uh, genomics. It's uh, the implementation of an AI model for genomic imputation. I'm gonna get uh, into more detail on that, what is imputation, what it's used for, uh, and how it can be useful uh, for your re research. Uh, the second project is, is more focused on uh, AI models for uh, mutation screening, for mutating proteins, enhancing uh, proteins of uh, interest. So I'll start by focusing on the first project. And if we have enough time, if I don't get too excited and get into much detail in the first project, if we have enough time, then uh, I'll go through the second project as well. So what exactly is uh, genomic imputation? So when you are in the field trying to uh, extract genomic information on plants or extracting uh, genomic information on uh, animals, usually there are two typical methods utilized for extracting uh, the genetic information on multiple samples. One of these methods is called uh, genotype array. Right, so you, you genotype the samples. The genotype array is very sparse, which means there are a lot of missing values. So you will not know all the DNA letters, all the ACTGs of your uh, sample, but you will know you will extract a few uh, points of, a few positions of interest in the genome. The other method is called whole genome sequencing, uh, which is the one demonstrated here below where you have basically every single uh, nucleotide in the whole genome of the samples. So this method is usually tenfold, uh, 10 times more expensive than the genotype array, and it takes longer. So if you are a plant breeder or you are applying genomic selection on your samples, you would be more interested in a cheaper and faster method to, to apply in real time doing your experiments rather than a slow and expensive method. That's why the genotype array is the most popular method for acquiring the, the genetic data on samples that need a, a very fast turnaround time. So then what will we do if we have so many missing values? If we have uh, missing values, we cannot know the full picture of the genome, we cannot extract the full content of information, and then we cannot map, fully map, all the associations between phenotypes and genotypes. 
So there is a method, a statistical method called imputation, genomic imputation, particularly, that will use a reference panel of uh, fully sequenced uh, genotypes or genomes, and will use the similarities between this reference panel and the genotype array data, your input data, to estimate, to fill in those missing values and do the best guess, the most um, likely uh, nucleotide in each one of those missing genomic positions. And then finally, you have the full data that you can work with. So imputation will allow you to do a much better analysis of potential causal genetic variants that are associated with a geno uh, phenotype. For example, uh, resistance to climate change, to extreme temperatures, uh, resistance to pathogens or biomass production, etc. Um, you can also boost the statistical power of your uh, genome-wide association analysis, and you can also do meta-analysis. Once you have the whole data, then you can merge multiple data sets that were used with different, uh, were generated with different genotype arrays that have different sets of genomic positions genotyped. So everything is aligned together and uh, matching, then you can uh, merge these different data, data sets coming from different sources. So there are many advantages of doing imputation. Uh, one example of uh, application is when you have uh, different uh, genetic uh, variants of uh, different plants on the field, and then you genotype those variants, and you phenotype them to find any specific traits of interest, and then you breed those plants, and you uh, acquire new genotypes and new phenotypes, and you keep the cycle until you select the best uh, genomes that have a, a better breeding value or a better uh, phenotype of interest. If we use computational methods here, for example, the imputation and models for genomic selection, we can accelerate and make this process much cheaper than doing everything experimentally. So the only problem is that uh, the current statistical methods for imputation, they are based on hidden Markov models. And previous work has, uh, they have found that these methods are very dependent on strong correlations between those uh, genetic variants. Those correlations are called linkage disequilibrium. So if the LD is low, then the performance of these uh, statistical models will drop a lot. And these uh, statistical models also depend on prephasing, which is the process of determining from which gamete um, this um, this uh, genotypes came from. When we have one copy from the father and one copy from the mother, for example, if we are talking about uh, these uh, deployed uh, species, and and all, all these limitations drop remarkably the accuracy of the imputation methods. And one uh, solution that came to us that, that we hypothesize is that since AI models are uh, much more um, prepared to deal with randomness in the data and to filter these weak signals uh, from, from random noise and can deal with fragmented data with um, uh, unexpected variations in the data. And AI is not so dependent on linear correlations. It can detect nonlinear signals as well, nonlinear associations as well between the variants. Then AI would be a better method uh, for uh, doing imputation, especially on those regions that are less predictable, that they don't have such a strong correlation between the genetic variations. So with that in mind, with that hypothesis, we implemented an AI model for doing imputation. The end-to-end -end pipeline consists of starting from a ground truth data set, a large data set that contains 
all every single nucleotide is a whole genome sequencing data set. And then we simulate an infinite number of genotype arrays by randomly masking the data, replacing those uh, numerical encodings of nucleotides of the reference and alternate alleles in the population by uh, zeros, a pair of zeros, which means the individual doesn't have any copies of that specific genotype. So we gradually increase the masking, making this challenge more and more difficult for the model. And we provide this mask data as input data for our model. And our model will learn the relationships between these genetic variants, and it will learn the overall structure of linkage disequilibrium in the population and learn the overall data structure and it will reconstruct the clean and full uh, imputed data as close as possible to our ground truth data. So we provide as inputs the masked data simulating the, the genotype array data, very sparse data with a lot of missing values, and then the model will uh, reconstruct uh, the uh, imputed data. So the architecture that we use is an autoencoder. An autoencoder is a fully connected artificial neural network that it starts uh, with a very, very large number of neurons, and then it decreases the number of neurons all the way to a bottleneck. That bottleneck forces the model to learn what are the main features that are representative of the data structure. And it will allow us to avoid the the model uh, cheating or just copying over the data from input to output. So it needs to capture the information in a much smaller set of neurons and combine all that information into a latent representation that then will be used to reconstruct the original data. If that latent representation is representative of the original, the ground truth data, then we have a good imputation. If it's not, then the model will not be selected, it will fail, we need to set different parameters in the model. So we apply this whole process across um, the human genome uh, in chromosome 22, and we compare that to three other state-of-the-art uh, hidden Markov model based statistical imputation tools. So autoencoder here in red is our model, and we tested that uh, across different genotype arrays with different uh, missing uh, data levels. And we also tested that across different ethnicities, uh, multi-ethnic cohorts, and also European ancestry cohorts. And we compared the uh, imputation accuracy, comparing the ground truth to the imputed uh, uh, genotypes across different minor allele frequencies from the most rare variants to the most common variants. So across all these data points, except for, I think this one, the autoencoder, our proposed method, uh, surpassed, it, it outperformed any other of the statistical methods. So that was a good sign. The model was actually uh, capturing all the data structure and reconstructing those missing values correctly, more correctly than uh, the hidden Markov models. And more recently, uh, thanks to the Lyft AI uh, seed grant from IFAS, we were able to start adopting uh, this, um, this model that we use in humans before to uh, sweet corn population for just for the chromosome 10 right now uh, as a proof of concept to see if we, if we could take that architecture that we tuned, we trained for humans and adopt that model providing new training data with a similar process to, uh, to do imputation to fill those missing values in maize uh, genotype data. And we tested uh, the model on 90% missing data and 95% missing data, simulating very cheap and sparse uh, genotype arrays. And we split the results across a uh, weak linkage disequilibrium structure, the less predictable, regions of chromosome 10, and then a medium and strong 
a Lincoln disequilibrium, like the, the easier case for statistical models. And this kind of confirmed our, our hypothesis that the AI models are, they, they excel when the data uh, has a, a more noisy or less predictable uh, correlation structure, which is the result on top here. The, the proposed AI model surpassed um, the uh, Big O5, which is one of the most cited imputation, statistical imputation tools uh, used in, in genomic selection for plant breeding. So these preliminary results on chromosome 10 are very promising. And we submitted a, a USDA uh, seed grant, uh, and hopefully we'll get more funding to expand this across the whole genome of maize and other plants, hopefully. And in terms of speed, um, this horizontal line here at almost like few seconds of execution uh, is the results for the autoencoder. So it's on a low-end machine, like a gaming computer or gaming laptop. Our method was four times faster than the other three uh, statistical imputation methods. And on a high-end machine, like a hypergate or a supercomputer GPU node, our model was uh, 20 times faster. I think it's very interesting to see that we still get a good um, speed up, a good uh, speed in a low-end computer. If you think about that this tool would be an AI model that you use on the field coupled with your genotype uh, device. So you could do everything in, heal in real time on the field if you're genotyping uh, plants in in a genomic selection and plant uh, breeding uh, approach. So it's good to see that we don't need a super expensive machine to still be much faster than all the imputation tools uh, available. So more accurate and faster. So let me see how I'm, I'm doing on time. Okay, 20 minutes. I'll, I'll go through uh, a second project then. So uh, hopefully if we have enough time I can go a little bit uh, into detail into the second project as well. So in addition to uh, enhancing the data, improving the data quality and filling missing values in the genome, we have recently starting uh, with uh, enhancing and improving uh, protein stability and function as well. So mutation screening are uh, approaches where you try to, you start with a wild type protein, um, the sequence and structure, and then you can randomly apply mutations or you can use your knowledge to apply certain mutations or use uh, structural biochemical information to uh, do best uh, guesses of what mutations would improve the stability and function of the protein, and then you create models of those mutants and you use additional uh, computational tools to select the best candidates for doing experiments. In this project, we started uh, focusing as a case study on the Rubisco protein that you see here, its structure. It's a protein that has a very uh, important uh, relevance in agricultural sciences and ecology because it, it helps on carbon fixation, but it's a protein that in order to expand or scale up the, the carbon fixation, we would have to improve a lot its stability and, and efficiency of it, its function. So that's why it's interesting to mutate this protein. So we chose that as a starting case, but the idea is that our model would not be limited just to a protein family or a protein function. We could uh, apply this model to any other scenario, so any other case study. So if you have an interesting protein that you are interested in mutating as well and improving stability and function, we could try to tune this model for your specific case study. So to start leveraging AI for doing better mutations, we first ex explored what is already available uh, so the same way that the HMM models were our starting point and we proposed AI, actually there, there is already an AI model available published back in 2020 
that proposes applying AI, a convolutional neural network, to analyze the 3D structure of a protein and then uh, propose mutations that will improve the function and stability of the protein. In their work, uh, they describe the method as a local feature extraction. So for uh, a certain amino acid in the protein, it will extract the presence and absence of atoms in, in the neighborhood, 20 angstroms neighborhood of that amino acid. And then it will uh, predict what would be a better amino acid there a better residue that would be a better fit for improving uh, stability and function. And we started from that model. And the first suspicion that we had is that what if we are just extracting local features like that around the amino acid that we want to mutate, but we are fully ignoring the global context of that protein structure. So we decided anyways to go ahead and take the Rubisco protein structure and provide that to, to the mute compute model, that's the name. And we plot all the proposed mutations uh, represented here as a likelihood ratio. So in red are a very high probability mutations and then in blue are like very low probability uh, mutations to be applied. So from a first look, we found out that all these mutations are everywhere. And every time the program, the, this AI model proposes one mutation, it completely ignores any other mutations that it has done before. And it ignores the overall structure features of the protein. So we would have too many mutations to test in silico. And since we are just using local features and ignoring the, the overall structural context, we felt like there was a need to improve this model before you could move ahead with in silico analysis and then experiments. So that's when we uh, remember a previous project that we accomplished in the past where we would go throughout the structure of uh, the protein and the ligand uh, binding interface, and would, we would extract uh, global interaction features, which are the overall hydrogen bonding score, for example, uh, flexibility or deformation effect of the binding site, uh, hydrophobic context between the protein and the ligand, uh, repulsive or van der Waals interactions and the accessible to solvent area. And we were able to achieve a very decent binding affinity accuracy in our machine learning models just by using those uh, more global features or using this overall context around the, the protein and ligand binding interface and overall uh, accessible to solvent area of the protein. So that helped a lot those features helped a lot in predicting binding affinity. And then now our question was, would those features also help in predicting protein stability and function? Would these features help on predicting better mutations? And we start, uh, it's in progress right now, we started extracting all the global informations on uh, hydrogen bonding that can help to stabilize uh, internal secondary structures uh, structures in the protein, like alpha helixes and, and beta sheets. We also uh, started extracting the overall deformation effect of the protein in hydrophobic contacts that is also related to the protein stability and function. And these additional features that we have implemented before as well, but now we are extracting these features across the whole protein structure and within the protein structure, not just between protein and ligand. So now we are not limited to predicting binding affinity. What we want to do is to adapt the previous model that we had, that we used to predict binding affinity, but instead of predicting binding affinity, now we are predicting mutations 
that help to improve or stabilize these features. Okay. So we have uh, adapted this feature extraction approach and these results are the distributions of all these features across a training data set. Right now our training data set was 2000 structures, but we are in progress right now. We are running these features extractions and the idea is to increase all the way to 20 or 30,000 from the PDB redo uh, database. And from now, from this pre preliminary results, we can see that each feature has a very unique distribution with a different uh, median, uh, very unique skewness, different standard deviation. So they are capturing uh, unique and different aspects from the structure. And combined together, we hope that they will be uh, better predictors than just using local features. So what we are doing right now is to take these local features from uh, the previous publication, from this previous model. We're gonna reproduce the same local features, but then we're gonna combine that with the global features that we are extracting, the interaction features, not just presence and absence of atoms. And we hope that these two levels of features will complement each other, will improve uh, the accuracy of the model. And then we're gonna implement, we're gonna start with the same convolutional neural network that they implemented, but we'll test additional architectures of uh, artificial neural networks to see which one performs uh, better for predicting candidate mutants. And then we're gonna validate this model. Hopefully we're gonna have a smaller number of mutants, but more accurate mutants. Instead of having mutations everywhere, we're gonna have a very small set of candidates that are more accurate. And then it will be easier to validate them experimentally because we're gonna narrow the focus of uh, or mutation screening approach. And hopefully once we have this training validated, we're gonna be able to publish in, uh, this uh, invention disclosure and establish collaborations with any other uh, fellow IFAS members that have interesting proteins that they want to mutate to become more efficient. So this, just to summarize both of the ideas, how they uh, connect together, uh, I like to say that these two projects, they enhance the data in some way. In the case of the imputation, we are enhancing the genomic data by uh, filling uh, missing values and making the data more complete. Then you can make better predictions from it. And on the protein side, we are predicting, we're enhancing proteins, either stability or function, to uh, allow us to perform uh, better experiments or to generate uh, product in large scale to enhance the, the function efficiency of the proteins. All right, I, first of all, before ending this presentation, I must uh, remind that this is a collaboration effort. I'm just sending the message here, but there are many people involved in these uh, two projects. I would uh, highlight here uh, Dr. Schuster and Dr. Silva. They were the, the major uh, um, contributors of this of these two uh, projects. They did all the hard lifting, so thank you so much. Without uh, you, this, this project would be unfeasible. And to all our collaborators as well, thank you uh, for collaborators across IFAS and also collaborators from uh, Scripps Research Institute, NVIDIA, Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, and for the funding uh, sources from NIH and uh, Department of Energy. And thank you so much. I'll uh, leave you with this disturbing <laughs> meme and I'll uh, be hoping to answer any questions. Anybody has questions? Is yeah, I have a question. Yeah. May I? Yes, please. Yeah, so uh, I have a, uh, I was a few minutes late, maybe you already uh, answered this, but uh, for the first uh, part of the presentation, 
is the imputation the end goal or uh, uh, the goal of, uh, say, regression or pre uh, prediction type where we would take the impu uh, uh, imputed data and relate it to some uh, response variable of interest. So what uh, the big question, is imputation the end goal or not? Right. So in the first stage of the project, which is the stage that I presented today, we are only focusing on getting the best imputation as possible and provide this tool as a pre-processing tool for any uh, uh, genomic selection researcher, any, any people that are doing phenotype prediction to use. That's the first part of it. The next part is to take uh, the, these uh, best models that we were able to generate and then in collaboration with uh, Dr. Resende from the Horticultural Sciences Department, we're gonna test uh, how much uh, improvement in the genomic selection approach for maize, uh, improved maize varieties, this imputation will help. How, how much uh, improvement we'll see by using our AI model versus using the traditional uh, statistical imputation. So this would be a much more detailed validation of focusing a real, on a real experiment, a real case study, rather than just comparing imputation accuracy. We're going to see the end result, how much the genomic selection and phenotype prediction improve if we use those uh, imputed genotypes, or we can also use the latent features that this model extracts. That, that helps on the dimensionality reduction of the data. Okay, that, that's very good to uh, narrow down on the scope. I'm coming from the statistics world, uh, and uh, the consensus there is that uh, the best type of imputation is actually observing the real uh, uh, data. And mm -hmm. if that data is not observed, uh, then one needs to basically account for missingness. And when one replaces an A or missing value with something concrete, we are introducing information that was not uh, observed. Right. So maybe if the amount of that information is uh, minor, uh, one can live with that. If it is, say, um, 90 or 95 percent of the information, well, that's a, that's a question. I'm not saying that uh, one shouldn't uh, impute at all. I'm saying that uh, in the end, one needs to have the end goal. So here we are uh, imputing our missing covariates, and ultimately we want to relate them to some uh, response uh, variable or variables. And uh, uh, in the best case scenario, one would integrate out the missing data with Bayesian techniques as opposed to replacing them with something fixed. So that's, uh, of course, that, that may not be achievable in real world. But if one is a, a theoretical statistician, that's how they would proceed uh, w w without uh, any attempt to make it uh, real or uh, realistic. But ultimately, one would uh, when you have a, a specifically defined response variable, it would be interesting to see, at least in the simple scenarios, how uh, the model with different types of imputation performs versus a model that uh, has this imputed data actually observed. So that would be the uh, ultimate uh, uh, way to uh, rank the models, uh, not, not, uh, not, not really like uh, uh, comparing uh, one biased model with another biased model. Right. So that is, it, 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 it could be that your model is the best, but that is because all other models are bad. Right. In, in theoretically, in a perfect world, we would be able to do whole genome sequencing in a few seconds and very cheap price for everything. But that's not the reality. More than ninety percent of the uh, genomic selection input data is from genotype arrays, very sparse genotype arrays, with up to ninety-nine percent of missing data. So it's just unfeasible. It's cost prohibitive and time prohibitive to have the true data. So our best bet right now, the feasible approach, is to do imputation. Hopefully a decade from now, this will not make sense anymore and we will not need imputation. That would be a perfect solution. But for now, we need it. And we, the, the best we can do is to try to generate a model that is less biased as possible. But the, of course, there will always be some sort of level of bias. The model is only good 
as the input data used to train the model. Otherwise, garbage in and garbage out. And we need to be aware of that. And well, totally if you agree. do it once, if you do it once, yes, uh, my for, point is for, that. For the, uh, for the sake of time. Uh, sure, idea. sure, of course. Yeah, yeah uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for the response. <laughs> uh, uh, I would be happy to discuss this further. Yeah, for sure. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, yeah, Rafa? Uh, well, uh, do we have time or not? I can I can, I can send her my my question later. I don't want to uh, you know help people up, so it's okay. Okay, so yeah, Rafa will reach out to you directly. And Ferraro, hi, um, very nice presentation, Raquel. I was wondering about like what do you recommend to use? Like how much data do we need for the whole genome sequence to start the imputation? Uh, and also, if we can use or more complex variants other than SNPs for the imputation. Right. So the training set I used for humans, it had 30,000 individuals. And the one I used for maize had about uh, 3,500. Both were reasonably uh good in terms of uh independent testing accuracy it also depends on how complex and how weak is the correlation among the variants so if you have many rare variants with a weak signal you you are focusing on a very specific region of the genome that is very difficult to impute you may need more samples more whole genome sequencing samples if you are focusing on a region that is relatively conserved has a uh, a certain like a good alternate allele frequency it's not so rare then you may need less fewer samples so it's all about how rare are those variants that you want to select right so we, we can further discuss about that if you have a specific genomic region uh, in mind so yeah hopefully that helps and what what was the second part of the question again uh, was about the other types of variants for imputation. If you can kind of reconstruct the haplotypes using indels or structural variants as well. Right. Right now, the this prototype model that we have uh, published and that we are adapting for maize, it supports uh, biallelic sing, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms and uh, indels and insertions. We are still not uh, including, we plan to expand this for uh, copy number variations and structural variations as well, hopefully in a further version of the model that will be supported. Uh, Akio, uh, a follow-up question. So again, congratulations, nice talk. Uh, did you check the sequencing coverage? Uh, what is the impact of uh, how much you're gonna sequencing in terms of um, imputation accuracy? Right. So if for the whole genome sequencing, if you have anything uh, 10x or above uh, as average coverage for your ground truth data, that should be more than enough. You wouldn't need uh, dozens of thousands of samples. You can uh, start with a reference of 2,000 samples, 3,000 samples. Again, it may vary depending minor allele frequency, how rare those variants are. And if you have low pass data uh, with 5x, for example, coverage, you will need more reference samples because there will be more random noise in the data, more missing values in the data. So we're going to need more reference samples to train the model. So that would be the major issue. Lower the coverage, more samples we need. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Hi. Oh. Go ahead, Jose. Thank you. Yeah, this is Jose from Plant Pathology. Nice presentation. Uh, very quick question, but maybe maybe there is no answer for this. So is the model kind of uh, contemplate or you're contemplated to uh, improve the model to kind of detect or, or, or study kind of uh, different type of mutations like uh, somatic mutations or germline mutations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, this model could be 
easily adapted to those kinds of mutations instead of you're saying like instead of focusing on population variations we are focusing on uh, for example a cell line that has different mutations as the disease progresses right correct Tumor. like a cancer for example mm -hmm. yeah the input data encoding when we convert everything to numerical uh, presence and absence of variants or mutations that encoding would be the same um, but there would have to be at least some weak correlation structure between these mutations if there is at least some weak correlation structure then the model should be able to capture it if those mutations are completely random I'm afraid that the model would just predict what is the most common mutation. It would not really learn the structure of the data. So that would be my only concern. We we could test that if we have enough data. Sorry, I think I, I'm not hearing Jose. Oh, right, sorry. Because we are talking more about a, in, in a somatic type somatic time mutation, we are talking more about a single single cell mutation event, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Right. So what the model would predict are the most common mutations if if they are completely random or if there's some sort of uh, structure, yeah. uh, non-random pattern, it would detect that pattern. So that, that yeah. would be something to test. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, great presentation. I'm uh, eager to talk to you later. Thank you very That's much. Great. Yeah. Happy to collaborate. Hello, Raquel. Again, Hi. I echo other uh, audience uh, comments. It's a very nice presentation. I also learned a lot of things from your uh, talk. So I'm very interested uh, uh, in, in the second part, uh, you talked about using uh, AI model in particular, seemed like you used uh, convolutional neural networks for mutation screening. You cited uh, one, yeah, one study. Um, yeah, I'm just curious for this uh, protein structure, they are in 3D, right? Do you need to process them, pre-process the 3D structure of a protein to make them 2D? Then you use a convolutional neural network to process, or this model is adopt, adapted to process a 3D um, image? Right, so this is a 3D convolutional neural network. Okay. So it's like, when you have a three-dimensional picture, you have a width and height and a time point. That would be like a video, for example. It, we would use a 3D uh, CNN. In this case, instead of having a width, height, and time, we have um, the X, Y, and Z coordinates, the three-dimensional coordinates. And this 3D structure uh, fits perfectly into the architecture of the 3D CNN. So there is no much adaptation that is needed to do. The only, the only thing that we need uh, to encode whenever we try to uh, provide atomic coordinates and uh, amino acid information into a 3D CNN is that it will not accept any text. We need to encode all these features into numerical representations or embeddings. So that's the most uh, uh, time consuming part for each one of the amino acids that we want to explore mutations for. We have to voxelize this region around the amino acid. We have to convert uh, this region into uh, data points that are 3D pixels. So we, we kind of convert that into a 3D picture. And Whenever we have the data converted, converted, then it's easy to encode the presence and absence of atoms, carbons, nitrogens, et cetera, into zero and one, like zero for absence and one for presence. So after all this numerical encoding, then everything flows smoothly through uh, 3D CNN. This was what the original authors proposed in our case, we're gonna test the, the same architecture they use with our new features, but we are also exploring the idea of uh, including a 3D uh, transformer model architecture. Because then in addition to selecting features, regardless, uh, regardless of their positioning, the transformer model would identify positional relationships as well instead of just looking at the presence and absence of certain motifs or patterns. 
So hopefully the transformer, the 3D transformer approach will be uh, more robust in this case. Yeah, I think uh, that sounds great. Actually, my lab has been investigating uh, plant uh, 3D uh, images, uh, primarily uh, through the form of a point cloud. We also voxelize those point cloud in 3D. We investigate those uh, point voxel uh, convolutional neural networks for 3D image processing. Yes, yeah, so there's some similarity between our work and oh, your yeah. work. Yeah, yeah. We're doing very yeah. similar data processing yeah. then. Yeah, That's yeah. Nice. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay. Thank you. There's one more question in the chat about how much is the minimum data amount that we need for this type of research? For the mutation screening part of the, the second project, um, we already have a vast amount of training data from the PDB redo database. So we would start training the model on every single protein that exists in public databases. And we, we would start from that. And then if we have a couple hundred examples of structures of uh, a specific protein superfamily that you want to focus on, we could further tune the model specifically for that protein superfamily or, or protein uh, family. So the, the, the advantage here is that we are using a, a transfer learning technique, let's say, with this big database, including all protein types, all protein functions. We are teaching the model the overall patterns that help to preserve protein function. It, 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 the, the model is kind of learning how evolution works, <laughs> what generates a, a fit protein, evolutionary fit protein overall. And then we can further tune the model with a small sam sample size. So in this case, it's, it's easier than the imputation uh, project. Great. Solomon, does it answer your question? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any other question from audience? Okay. Uh, I hear none. Uh, if there there is no question, thank you very much again for Dr. Diaz for a nice and great uh, presentation. Uh, we will share the recording with everyone else. Uh, and the next seminar will be March twenty uh, second, on the Friday, uh, with Dr. Kevin Wong and Dr. Sabai Grunwald. We will send you uh, the advertisement again. Thank you and have a great day and great weekend. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend. <laughs>